Good evening, everyone. We're about to get started with our 7.30 session. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Uh, we have quite a distinguished set of speakers and panelists this evening, so I want to get right underway to make sure that we have enough questions at the end. For those of you who have not been with us during the course of today, we actually are using a, an app called Slido. And so you go on to the, you just type in slido.com, and it doesn't, you don't have to download anything. You simply can put in um, hashtag CMU Energy, and it allows you to answer, to ask questions. And so we'll be able to see all of your questions for a moderated part at the end. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Michael McQuaid. So Michael McQuaid is a Carnegie Mellon University Vice President for Research, providing leadership for the university's research enterprise and advocating for the role that science, technology, and innovation play nationally and globally. From 2006 to 18, he served as Senior Vice President for Science and Technology at UTC, where he's, his responsibilities included providing strategic oversight and guidance for research, engineering, and development activities throughout the business units of the corporation and at United Technologies Research Center, focused on a broad range of high technology products and services for the global aerospace and building systems industries. And as we like to say, he's also the triple threat because he is an undergrad and graduate PhD from Carnegie Mellon. So without further ado, Michael McQuaid. Good evening, everybody. I have some <clears throat> actual things I want to say, but I'm going to stop only because um, my association with the Scott Institute goes back to the beginning, and uh, it was a different world then. It was a different world on the kind of things we focus on at the national policy level. It was a different world in the way we think about energy and climate, and so I, I find myself compelled always before speaking to a group about energy to just remind everybody that what you do matters even more now than it did five years ago or six years ago. The, challenges we face have only gotten stronger, they've only gotten more impactful, and the work of the Institute and the work of everybody in this room matters even more than it did when we started this journey of, of the Scott Institute and Energy Week. So that's my ad lib. Um, with that, I want to welcome everybody here. Many of you were here earlier today, so I'm glad they gave the short bio so you didn't have to hear it twice. Um, we have two evening sessions tonight. They focus on uh, particularly on creating a resilient future for the city of Pittsburgh. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier today, for those of you who are here, uh, the, the commitment we are making to the resilience of our cities is where we will make fundamental change in the energy, climate, and livability of the country and the world. Uh, all of the activities start at the city level. And so you're going to hear about that today, uh, tonight. Um, Across the rest of the Energy Week, including today, our panels and our keynotes have highlighted forward-thinking research, will highlight forward-thinking research, emerging industry trends, cutting-edge technologies that will change how we meet energy challenges. Um, today's first set of sessions talked about the sweeping changes in the United States that we've seen in energy technologies um, just in the last five years, um, including uh, for those of you who were regaled by, by Tom Siebel today, including the challenges of cybersecurity in the energy space, or as Tom said, maybe he's already given up and sort of has got his head stuck in the ground because he thinks it's an unsolvable problem. I don't think so, and that's why we're all here. Um, but also how innovation plays in the energy sector, how innovation plays writ large in the way we both consume energy and generate energy. Um, and I would say that the variety of subjects across today for those of you from outside the CMU community, the way the variety of subjects are both presented and addressed is representative of the way we believe we think at CMU. We get up every day with a DNA that goes back to a university that was founded to create an educational experience for the children of steel workers, and those children of steel workers built the city that their fathers and mo mostly fathers, fathers and mothers built in the steel industry, but created a city of this kind of vibrant economy, an economy that understands the livability necessities of a, of a city like Pittsburgh. Energy Week is a catalyst for that conversation, um, and it provides an important forum for all of us to discuss and learn about important topics across the whole spectrum. 
So thank you for being here. Thank you for the fortitude to be here this evening. And I think uh, Anna and the team have put together a terrific program for you. Um, with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Rich Fitzgerald. Uh, mostly it's my pleasure, no, partially it's my pleasure to introduce him because he is a CMU alum. Um, and that gives us great confidence because his day job is as the county executive here in Allegheny County. And, you know, it, it, there is just a tremendous interaction between the city and the county and the problems and the challenges that we face uh, in the hands of a CMU alum make us all feel a lot more confident in the path forward. So, Rich, it's all yours. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. Um, he's done that twice today, so he's really getting good at that. And I might take you on the road with me, Michael, for those introductions. I also want to congratulate Anna and the Institute, um, the Scott Institute and others for putting this on over the next couple of days as we bring the, 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 the brightest minds and the youngest uh, energy innovation that we can do for, for things that really do matter. You know, when I was at this university 40 years ago, um, I know I don't look that old, but I was here 40 years ago. Um, you know, most of the things that we did around energy were around saving money. Um, now we have uh, also the ability and, and the desire to save money, but we're also talking about saving the planet. And so we've talked and taken it to obviously a, another level of what's important on energy and energy usage and energy savings. Um, and, and I again want to also congratulate and thank uh, President Johani and Farnham has been a tremendous partner. This university has continued to be over the years, and Farnham's certainly taken it to the, um, to the next level as well. You know, you heard from Mayor Peduto earlier today and the collaboration that we have between the city and the county around things like how we run government, how we transport people, our transportation system, our infrastructure. They're so interrelated. And, you know, Michael talked about, you know, the steel workers who, you know, built this city and, quite frankly, built this institution over a century ago. But what you're going to find out tonight is really the change in Pittsburgh, because it's not going to be four fathers who are going to be up here. It's going to be four mothers who are running things uh, in, in Allegheny County and in western Pennsylvania. Um, the mayors, uh, Domi, uh, Karina Ricks, uh, running the transportation and infrastructure process of, of the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, Catherine Kellerman, who runs the transit agency, the Port Authority of Allegheny County. Uh, Orletta Scott Williams, who runs Alcasan, the, the, the water and the sewer system that we all know about and, and all that we're under with that. And Mary Contora, who runs the Sports and Exhibition Authority, running the three sports venues as well as the greenest convention center in North America. Uh, you may have noticed that those names are all female that are running the major, major entities and the major institutions in this region. And Christy's going to be the, the panel moderator to keep them all. So I, I think that change, is, is, as well as anything else, signifies where we are uh, in this region and where we're moving forward. Um, that the, the talents we have are inclusive of everybody, where maybe a generation or two ago that really wasn't the case. Uh, but uh, energy savings, uh, working on sustainability is something that we really, really care about. Um, I can tell you that in Allegheny County, we buy 35% of our energy from renewables, solar, wind, et cetera. And I know, you know Jessica Mooney, who's here with me tonight, is working on a project to try to get that up to 50% or maybe even more than that. We're going to continue to push the boundaries of what we can do on those type of things and really improve our, uh, improve our little corner of the world, which hopefully will be an example to what everybody else does. But it doesn't happen <clears throat> without collaboration without us working together, without a great partner like Mayor Peduto, and, and two of the entities you're going to see tonight are actually a shared uh, authority that's shared between the city and the county. So those board members are appointed half by the county executive and half by the mayor. Um, and they work together to, to, to work at the Sports and Exhibition Authority in Alcasan, among two examples of, of how we collaborate and how we do the things we're going to continue to do. But we couldn't do that without the good ideas that come out of symposiums like this. Uh, out of universities like Carnegie Mellon, next generation of technology that we can then take to the public sector on into the private sector and make Pittsburgh uh, and Allegheny County everything it can be. So with that, I want to just thank all of you for allowing me to come uh, and be part of this uh, great panel. And I'm looking forward to hearing uh, these four experts and some of the great work that they're doing at some of the major entities we have in this region. Thank you.
So we have a lot of collaborators for this panel this evening, and Tracy Serto is one of them. Tracy Serto is the founder and publisher of Next Pittsburgh, which is an online publication fo uh, focused on the people advancing the Pittsburgh region. So Next, Next Pittsburgh has just celebrated its fifth anniversary, and Tracy would like to invite all of you to the party on May the 7th. So Tracy. Hello, everyone. Um, it is my honor tonight to introduce you to Harmeet Singh. Harmeet has nearly two decades of experience leading technology teams that have built scalable, reliable, and high-performance software systems in energy, transportation, and telecommunications industries. As Chief Technology Officer at GreenLots, Singh has been at the forefront of designing interoperable system architecture for GreenLots' award-winning Sky Platform. He is actively involved in open standards development and is an active stakeholder in Open Charge Alliance. He assured me you would all know what that means. Prior to joining GreenLots in 2012, Harmeet was Black BlackBerry's lead engineer. He's also served as technical architect and senior software engineer for Pillar Data Systems, as a senior consultant at Burnt Sand, and as an analyst at TCS, which is part of India's largest industrial conglomerate. Singh holds a Master of Science degree in software management from right here at Carnegie Mellon University. And tonight, he will talk about trends in transportation and sustainability and how they converge and how they impact people in cities like Pittsburgh. What should we be looking forward to? Harmeet is about to give us the answer. Harmeet? Well, thank you for that introduction. And thank you, Carnegie Mellon, for inviting me here to speak today at Energy Week. It's great to be back here, and I'm extremely grateful and fortunate for the opportunity to speak to this audience. You know, every once in a while, a new disruptive technology comes about and changes everything around us. It alters our behavior and habits that we have formed over decades or even longer. These innovations result in products, services, and other conveniences that become a part of our daily lives, part of our society and communities. They start shaping the world around us. And I think that we are witnessing a similar disruption in transportation and energy today. We're witnessing a unique convergence of energy and transportation. And I think that I, and including everyone who's playing a big part of it, or a small part of it, is extremely fortunate. In 2012, when I joined Green Lots, it was a small, scrappy startup. Some dismissed us as you know, three men in the back of a truck. Um, but we had a big vision to electrify transportation, to accelerate the growth of electric vehicles. Today, GreenLots technology enables EV charging for a number of cities, utilities, municipalities, automotive, fleets, and many other enterprises across the globe. In January of this year, GreenLots was acquired by Shell New Energies, uh, which is a subsidiary of Dutch oil major that is investing billions in advanced energy, sustainability, renewables, and new mobility technologies. The acquisition was a testament to not only what we've accomplished as, at GreenLots, but also a clear signal to the market that electric vehicles are becoming mainstream and are not simply a passing fad. Mobility is fundamental to human condition. It connects people, empowers communities, and impacts our society. We need new mobility solutions powered by advanced energy to connect people and places in safer, cleaner, and a smarter way. 
Today, we are witnessing unprecedented challenges for transportation in urban cities. The trend toward, towards urbanization means that by 2050, about 70% of the global population, which will have reached 10 billion by mid-century, will live in cities, up from 55% today. And the number is much higher in North America and Europe, where over 80% of population already lives in cities. Urbanization has had a massive impact on air quality. Nearly two-thirds of cities around the world currently exceed the WHO's pollution guidelines. Not surprisingly, most of this pollution affects the lower income communities. And despite the significant progress that has been made in lowering emissions from the power sector by switching to renewables, emissions from transportation sectors are actually on the rise in the United States. Even in California, which has the most progressive government in the world, has spent, has spent billions to combat carbon emissions, the tailpipe pollution is still going up there. Americans spend an astonishing 30 billion hours stuck in traffic every year, mostly driving in and out of suburbs to cities. And this not only contributes to poor air quality, but it's also a massive productivity loss. It is estimated that almost 30% of urban traffic is caused by drivers just looking for parking. And I know we all love the convenience of services like Amazon Prime, but that too has an impact. Expedited shipping means your packages are not consolidated, leading to more cars and trucks on the street in our cities, which researchers have found is adding more congestion to our cities and pollutants to our air, and not to mention cardboards to our landfills. Now, these challenges need to be addressed quickly and efficiently as the transportation plays an essential enabling role in a city's sustained economic prosperity. I think the good news is that we already have technologies that can solve many of these problems. The challenge is getting those adopted and deployed at scale. You know, how easy is it is to disrupt and provide innovative solutions and change mental models, regulations, infrastructure planning strategies that have evolved and solidified over the last century. So if we take a look at some of the recent key innovations that has happened over the last couple of decades, um, we'll find some evidence that it's possible. You know, one of my favorite books that I read during my program in CMU was Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore, which talks about the different phases of new technology adoption life cycle, you know, starting from innovators to early adopters to early majority to late majority to laggards. And there's a chasm that exists between early adopters and early majority. And any technology and any innovation to be successful, it's critical for that to cross this chasm to achieve mass adoption. Some innovations that have successfully crossed this chasm in the last couple of decades are smartphones, you know, flat panel TVs, and tablets. It's hard to imagine today, but it wasn't too long ago that the idea that we'd all be holding a supercomputing device in the palm of our hands would have been laughable. It's also important to note that disruptions usually happen from the outside. While all major auto manufacturers are now getting serious about electrification, it was not Detroit that jump-started the EV revolution. It was a small, scrappy startup in Silicon Valley. Incumbents in well-entrenched industries have a very hard time innovating, and they often get caught off guard by new technologies and business models. However, big entrenched industries aren't the only ones that miss major transformations. In the 1980s, McKinsey, widely considered to be of the most influential consultancy in the world, 
told AT&T not to worry about cell phones. They said uh, it's not going to be more than 90,000 cell phones by 2000. And it turned out to be more than 110 million. About a decade later, Forbes ran a tagline, a headline on their magazine on Nokia said, can anyone catch the cell phone king? Now, by the show of hands, and how many of us here are having Nokia cell phones in our purses and pockets? Oh, oh. We've got some collectors. <laughs> so. Despite the early transformation, the existing automobile industry has not really seen significant disruption until the last few years. Yes, cars got more comfortable, and some new features were introduced, like seat belts, stereos, power windows. But consider this, Henry Ford's Model T back in 1908 got between 13 to 21 miles per gallon. 100 years later, the national average fuel economy was 25 miles per gallon. Sure, cars go faster and further, but that's a telling statistic. There's only so much efficiency we can get out of internal combustion engine. While innovations in electric transportation may be in the early stages of the chasm adoption life cycle, they have a large potential to massively disrupt the industry's infrastructure and landscape. Henry Christensen, a Danish robotist, and a uh, professor of computer science made the bold claim that kids born today will never need a driver's license. Let's take a closer look at these trends that are shaping the future of mobility, which are connected, autonomous, shared, and electric. A connected vehicle ecosystem is becoming a reality. A connected car is equipped with internet access, and with that, the transmission of data and receiving of data is possible. Not only can critical data be transmitted from vehicle to vehicle, but also city planners can have real-time access to the data to, and allows the, that allows them to uh, design systems that adhere to changing flow of traffic. Access to internet also allows additional services inside the vehicle to enhance the driving experience. Think about the new business opportunities and the whole set of new business models that this could generate. The next big trend, a hot topic of, of conversation, is autonomous. As many of you know, there has been significant research and development work on autonomous vehicles right here in CMU. Tens of billions of dollars are being invested in this space. Waymo, for example, is already running their level four self-driving vehicles as part of the early rider program in Phoenix, Arizona. These vehicles are currently geofenced, meaning they are limited to a carefully mapped area. However, these vehicles are driving 3.4 million, have already actually already driven 3.4 million miles on public roads. And in simulation, they're driving about 8 million miles every day. So every mile driven provides new data that can be used to make these vehicles smarter and safer, accelerating trend towards automation. A company called Neuro, which recently raised nearly a billion dollars from SoftBank, is already delivering groceries for Kroger in Scottsdale and Houston using small driverless vehicles. This is the future and it's happening. With the drop in the cost of supercomputing in technologies such as computer vision and LiDAR, the mobility of future holds a big promise in safety and convenience. Eric Schmidt, the former Google CEO, once commented that it's a bug that cars were invented before computers. And I think he was right. Despite the obvious trend, many people remain skeptical. While there are certainly legitimate safety concerns and you know, how it is regulated and how we deal with the uh, threats of cyber attack, we should pause to consider that there are over 30,000 fatalities in the US every year due to accidents attributed to human error. These crashes also cause 
two million, over two million injuries every year, and tens of billions of dollars of expense. There will always be some element of danger involved in new mode of transportation, but there will be a time when people will look back at us and consider us crazy for tolerating such a dangerous mode of manual transportation for so long. The other major trend that's happening in mobility is underscored by the frenzy around Uber and Lyft's upcoming IPOs. Ride sharing, which essentially breaks every parent's rule to never get in the car with a stranger, has become a normal part of our daily lives. And in a very short amount of time. I know it's hard to imagine a world with little or no car ownership, especially in a country like the US where cars are so fundamental to our history and the idea of personal freedom. But cars are the second most expensive asset for most Americans after their home. And if you think about it, it just sits around most of the day. Cars are parked for 96% of the time. Most of us end up taking out loans, going into significant debt to own this asset. When you consider this, it's not hard to imagine consumers choosing a monthly subscription model over you know, when they need a car over owning one. While there was an unfortunate false start to EVs in the 1990s, which was depicted in the documentary film, Who Killed the Electric Car? It's undeniable that EVs are going mainstream. Uh, we've heard that even James Bond is going electric. And, and there are a number of reasons for this shift. Uh, you know, first, as anyone who's ever driven an electric car can attest to this fact that it's an incredibly fun vehicle to drive. The instant power from electric drivetrain provides a, a rapid acceleration, instant acceleration. It's a great feeling, and once you have experienced it, you, know, you won't want to go back. Secondly, EVs are 10 times more efficient than in, in the internal combustion engine vehicles. The internal combustion engines are highly inefficient. Most gasoline combustion engines have an average thermal efficiency of about 20%. That means 80% of the fuel can get lost as heat. So let's think about that when we are filling up our gas tank next time. The third, EVs are much easier and cheaper to maintain. It's about 20 moving parts compared to 2,000 in, in ICE vehicles. Uh, simply put, there's just, less, there's just less that can go wrong in an EV. Fourth, governments around the world are developing and promoting public policy to drive EV growth to meet their climate goals. In Norway, for example, half of all new cars sold in 2018 were electric or plug-in hybrid. And finally, and this is the big one, EVs will be cheaper without subsidies by mid-2020s. The largest expense in an EV is the battery, and the battery costs are declining rapidly. In many cases, electric buses, which run all day on predictable set routes, are already cheaper than legacy diesel buses, which run um, on, on, a, on a total cost of ownership basis. In China, there are already more than 300,000 electric buses. Pittsburgh will have its electric buses coming to service later this year. They're popping up everywhere. And an, an analysis of 29 global automakers found that they are investing a combined $300 billion in electric vehicles. So let's look ahead to see where this electrification trend is headed. 2018 was a record year for EVs, and 2019 will surpass that, and sales will be more than double of what was sold in 2017. It makes me feel really happy when I look back at this. 2012 is when I started in this industry and how far we are, you know, we've come along, and it looks like a great trend. An analysis of 29 global automakers that I already mentioned are, are investing upwards of $300, million, uh, $300 billion in EVs.
With decline in battery prices and overall costs of EVs, owning an EV is becoming more economically viable. Bloomberg estimates that more than half of all new car sales will be electric by 2040. As previously mentioned, mentioned uh, major automakers are investing billions in electric vehicles. Ford will invest $11 billion and launch 40 new EV models in the next three years. Volkswagen has announced investment plans of $84 billion by 2030. The widespread support from auto OEMs, governments, utilities, and energy providers around the world is accelerating this trend. So here's a picture of Fifth Avenue on Easter morning in 1900. There was only one automobile in this picture, one circled in red. Now let's take a look at the same location, same day of Easter morning, but this time only 13 years later. In the first picture, you've got one automobile and everything else is horse and a buggy. In the second picture, it's hard to spot a horse carriage. It took little more than a decade to completely transform how people move from place to place. Now, many of you probably have seen these photos, but they're a great visual representation of the pace of innovation. That's incredible, especially when you consider that an entire new auto manufacturing industry had to be built using new industrial processes like the assembly line, new workers had to be trained, and new roads and fueling infrastructure had to be built. And all this was done while the country was fighting World War I. Now, just as a side note, an urban workhorse dumped 20, between 20 and 50 pounds of manure a day on the street along with a gallon of liquid waste. Imagine that, and that's what they were worried about. But now we got smog. So what do we need to do to accelerate the growth of electric vehicles? Just in the United States alone, we will need an additional 5 million charging ports to support 7 million EVs that are expected to be on the road by 2025. So what will be the impact of this massive charging infrastructure on our grid and on our cities? Each electric vehicle adds an additional load to the electric grid. And it will amplify greatly as the number of electric vehicles on our, in our cities grow. So a block with 10 homes that all have an EV in a driveway will become equivalent to a block with 20 homes. What makes this electric, co electric load even unique is that it moves. It's not something that we had seen before and not what our electric power distribution system was designed with in mind. In fact, the grid could fail catastrophically if the entire US car fleet was switched over to electric today. Charging capacity requirements present challenges and will require that we change our mental model on infrastructure planning. High power charging technology is already at 150 to 350 kilowatt and it's going up to a megawatt. There's a few of these chargers can easily create a load upward of a megawatt. And without, and what about everyone plugging in in their home to charge in the evening? EV owners' charging behavior results in a distinctive load shape with implications on the grid infrastructure and tariff structures for charging. We will see an increase in peak energy usage, grid congestion, which can lead to rolling brownouts and blackouts, and the increase in power demand can overload critical assets leading to equipment failures. While building capacity is very capex heavy, that's where companies like Greenlots bring in their smart charging and grid balancing technologies. With the combination of solar, battery storage, and software, charging rates can be optimized while protecting the impact on grid and meeting the driver expectations. So let us further review the convergence of energy and mobility. 
and how that unlocks new possibilities. Wind and solar now accounts for 8% or over 8% of total generation capacity in the US. In 2018, solar and wind accounted for majority of new power generation, claiming well over three quarters of the total new capacity added nationally. Solar and wind power together are projected to provide two thirds of all electricity by 2050. We have over 800 gas speaker plants around the country. The speaker plants are designed to be called on only when the demand for electricity spikes. For example, during a summer heat when the air conditioners are running full blast. Billions of dollars worth of generating assets that are used for just a few hours per year. Their annual utilization is under 6%. This is a staggering level of inefficiency and expense in order to maintain grid reliability. However, thanks to impressive innovation and increasing demand for electric vehicles, battery storage is beginning to challenge the business case for the speaker plants. We already have solar per storage projects that beat traditional speaker plants. The battery market is going through massive growth. I'm sure everyone's heard about the massive gigafactory that Tesla has built in Nevada, but Tesla is not alone. There are, at, at the moment, 68 gigafactories in the pipeline globally. So how is all of this relevant to electric mobility? How can EVs help us get the maximum value from these latest energy trends and help with our infrastructure? And for the entrepreneurs in the crowd, how can these create new and exciting business models and startups? EVs present, actually present a great opportunity because they're essentially an energy storage on wheels. Charging our EVs by following the renewable curve not only allows us to drive using the power of sun and wind, but also lets us store the extra renewable capacity in our cars. An electric vehicle can store two full days of electricity for the average American home. Daisy chain, a few electric vehicles, and you can get a virtual peaker plant. Electric buses and other medium and heavy duty electric fleets with fixed or predictable routes can also be used as a great resource for the grid. For example, a fleet of electric school buses that are not used in the evening can easily provide upward of a megawatt hours of additional local capacity and power to smooth out in a, an evening peak. Vehicle grid integration, more commonly known as a VGI technology, is a very popular topic that covers various ways in which EVs can help manage the grid. Load growth from electric vehicles is great for the electric sector, but EV load is unevenly distributed across locations and time of day. These challenges can be met through vehicle grid integration strategies that can actively manage these loads and balance the grid. With millions of electric cars expected on the roads over the next decade, utilities see both an opportunity to sell drivers more electricity and risk that surges in charging at peak times could destabilize stressed power grids. The idea is that if you charge your electric vehicle at off-peak times and are presented to sell power back to the grid, when it's under strain, you could effectively charge for free. With planned infrastructure enabled by technology that integrates with utility grid and with their IT infrastructure, we can now orchestrate an energy system where electricity can power mobility. This is becoming more possible now that the global power and energy industry has transcended to a dynamic platform of two-way communication and intelligent grid architecture known as an energy cloud. Because of this enabling technology, we can communicate with the grid, power generation sources, and charging infrastructure instantaneously. But in order to connect traffic patterns, energy demand, and power generation in real time, in, in real time we need data. Charging utilization data, consumer data, grid data, 
we need to analyze it in real time so that grid operators can instantly respond to dynamic events. Eventually, with technology such as blockchain, we can evolve into a system where individuals can make instant energy transactions with their peers. We have already started building the charging infrastructure for residential workplace and public charging. But if we are going to truly optimize and leverage this shift in mobility to transform how we fuel our vehicles and transportation systems, we need to engage key stakeholders. And we can create an infrastructure where everything is connected and participating in an energy ecosystem that powers all the vehicles, enables more utilization of renewables, and still keeps our lights on. We need to select sites for charging infrastructures in order to maximize the charging utilization, but also to be careful not to avoid the local distribution network. Building charging infrastructure at sites such as retail locations will have economic impact, and planners should also take that into account. So what does this mean to the city of Pittsburgh? The goals of the city of Pittsburgh are clear. They want to ensure safety, allow people to have access to goods and services, and ensure a high quality of life. Crossing the chasm and transitioning to an all-electric mobility future will help the city realize their goals. As I showed previously, innovation is not slow, linear, or incremental, but often governments fail to realize this which results in policymakers who are surprised by new innovations and often fail to regulate them successfully. Ride-hailing apps offer a prime example. To combat this mindset, governments at federal, state, and local level need to lean on the expertise of advisors with deep knowledge of science and technology. Pittsburgh is uniquely positioned because of the three decades plus that CMU has been pioneering automotive technology. I know Duquesne Light is embarking on an incentive program for the territory starting in the next couple of months. This program will provide a strong foundation for electric transportation in the region. We appreciate all the efforts that Sarah Oleksak and her colleagues are putting into standing up this program. How we move people and goods will be unrecognizable in 10 years from now. This mobility transformation will breed new ideas, thought leaders, and innovators. And especially for students here, what a great time this is to become involved in this transformation and as the future leaders create a cleaner, sustainable future for generations to come. So thank you all for listening to me. I'll be happy to answer any questions now or at any time later. Thanks.